All right, if you're in 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to look at a very familiar verse. Uh, maybe you have heard it, maybe you have not. It is a familiar verse in Christianity. It says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8, Be sober, be vigilant. Okay, you're always on the lookout because your adversary, the devil. Who's our adversary? The devil. That just makes sense in Christianity. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Someone has once said, why does the devil have to walk about? And the answer that someone gave was, maybe it's because the Christians have stopped running for Jesus Christ. I don't know. But it's also very possible that the walking about has the idea of more like a prey and a predator situation where at the moment's notice, I mean without moment's notice, he is going to deceive, he is going to jump out, he is going to tackle you. And what you must realize is that you have an adversary. You have an enemy. You have someone that is not flesh and blood like you and I are that is a greater enemy than anyone in this world ever could be and that is the devil and he is seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't care what happens to your life but can I say God cares what happens in your life. He loves you so much. Now take your Bibles and go to 1 Timothy with me. We introduce with the understanding that we have an enemy. In this series, What's On Your Mind, today we are talking about the closed mind. Now last week we referenced it as we talk about the contaminated mind, but today we are going to look at the closed mind. Before we read 1 Timothy chapter 4, look with me at the lesson overview on your handout. It says in 1 Timothy 4, Paul is very specific about why it is so important to keep a closed mind. With approximately 10,000 thoughts going through our brainwaves every day, it is easy for the wrong things to slip in. This lesson focuses on why having a closed mind is essential to living a Christ-pleasing life. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 with me. Notice what the Bible says. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. As we talk about a closed mind today, obviously we're not talking about a closed mind to God. We are talking about a closed mind to the attacks of the enemy and sin itself. So number one today, a closed mind guards against heretical deception. A closed mind guards against heretical deception. Letter A, the warfare of Satan. The warfare of Satan. And we look at verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now in the scriptures we find two different types of departure within the church. We find what it says in 1 John where it references they went out from us because they were not of us. 
But then you also find some who literally take a step away from everything that they know. They become prodigals in the faith. They run from the way of Jesus Christ and the way that they have been taught. And these are those that have been seduced by spirits that are not of God, seduced by the teachings or the doctrines of the devil. The devil never stops attacking. He is on a mission that will not end until he is cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. Listen, friends, I am glad that God has the last say. Amen. I am glad the devil is not above God. But let me say, until the day that he is destroyed, until the day God finally puts him away, there will be attacks and we will have to fight. You know, oftentimes the question of warfare in this world comes up. And let me simply state, you can fight for peace all you want to, but as long as there is sin in this world and the curse is over this world, there will always be warfare physically, just like there will always be warfare spiritually. But one of these days when Jesus Christ is in reign again, the Bible tells us the lion is going to lie with the lamb and the child is going to be able to play with the asp, with the serpent, and he won't get bit. I mean, one of these days, there really will be peace across every span of life that there is. But right now, right now, there is still a warfare going on. If you flip to 2 Timothy real quick, I want to show you something in chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. The very next book of the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. It says in verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax, what church? Worse and worse. Deceiving, but then notice this, being deceived. You know, sometimes we think about these verses and we look across our world and we realize, yes, it is growing worse. There's nothing new under the sun, but at the same time, it is growing worse. But what we must also take note is not only are they deceiving people, but they are deceiving themselves. They are going to continue in this lie unless God gets a hold of their heart. Notice what it continues to say in verse 14, but... Listen, that word there states that you don't have to fall under their guise. You don't have to fall under their deception. But here's how you defy it. Continue. That, that's all it takes right there. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. What are the things you have learned? My dear friend, it's right here, what I hold in my hand, what you hold in your hand. It is the word of God. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Today we sit with a Bible in our laps and these words that we have, they're not the words of man. God used man to pin them down over a 1500 year time period. These nearly 40 different men wrote with one person purpose in mind and that was the Lord Jesus Christ and God's redemptive plan. Some of these people didn't know one from the other but yet because it was authored by God himself and the spirit of God spake to holy men, these holy men pinned down the words that we have today. My dear friend, though God used men who were men who were holy to pin down the scriptures, God is the author of this book. And while we still have time in America with the freedom we have, we need to stand with the truth of God's word. There will always be a warfare against this book that you hold in your hand. You can find this warfare in government. You can find this warfare in the schools. You can find this warfare in your home. You can find this warfare in public places. There is no limit as to where the Bible will be fought, but it will continue to be fought. And here's the reason why we still have an enemy and there's a warfare from Satan that goes on let's look at letter B the weapon of Satan the great weapon of Satan the devil has an arsenal full of weapons he will use accusation 
And John wrote, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. He said that in Revelation 12.10. Uh, the devil will use opposition. Uh, that's why Peter said, as we read earlier, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil will use imitation. He tried that with Jesus when he said in Matthew 4, 9, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil tried to imitate God like he owned everything that ever was. But no doubt... Satan's number one weapon will always be deception. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. The devil loves deceiving people about immorality, about drugs, about alcohol. He loves deceiving people about the way of life. He deceives people about death. As many people think if they commit suicide, they will end it all. But in reality, they never do. But he saves his most sophisticated deception for the spiritual. How many people around the world are deceived about eternal life? What they believe sounds so right. How could something that my church teaches or how could something that my parents taught me or how could so many people believe something that could possibly be so wrong? There's a verse about that in 2 Corinthians. Listen to it. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel that word means messenger an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his messengers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works I don't care if they're a cardinal, I don't care if they're the Pope, I don't care if they're a minister in any denomination, I don't care if they're named as a Baptist preacher. My dear friend, if they're false, they're false. They can have an outer shell that looks like something godly being transformed into some kind of angel of light, but inwardly they are whited sepulchers. Inwardly they are full of dead men's bones. Inwardly they are dried up. There's no truth in reality to them. They can use their tongue in such a manipulative way because of the deception of Satan that empowers them. And we all need to be very well aware that our enemy is very good at deception. Years ago, the, the author of this was in a revival meeting and a young couple that had been newly saved informed their pastor that the Jehovah's Witnesses were coming by their home for Bible studies every week. Uh, they had not asked them to come, they just showed up. And the young couple didn't want to tell someone who was so religious that they weren't welcome in their home. The pastor was very upset that this was happening to these new converts, but... Really, he didn't know how or what to tell the young couple. I asked when they would normally come, and they told me it was the same time each week, said this evangelist. I, the evangelist, said, well, why don't you invite the pastor and me to come over about the same time the Jehovah's Witnesses come over? And they were more than happy to have us come. And so we arrived about 15 minutes before the regular time. Sure enough, they knocked on the door and the young couple immediately invited them in and introduced them to us. Of course, we did not reveal that we were Baptist preachers. They started their usual Bible study and we all listened intently. The young couple kept glancing at us as if to say, See, this is good. It's all about the Bible. After about an hour, the evangelist was getting weary of their deception and so asked the man, Do you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that the only way to heaven is through Him? The Jehovah's Witness said no and then tried to explain. And as soon as he said no, the young Christian, the man of the couple, jumped to his feet and said, What? 
You don't believe that Jesus was God? What are you going to teach me if you don't believe in my Savior? I'm sorry. You're going to have to leave now. Deception is all around us in different shapes and different sizes. It can even come covered in the words Holy Bible and not actually be the Word of God. We want to know that what we hold in our hands is truth. And we want to understand the doctrine that it teaches. And even with a Bible that is correct, there are people who can take verses out of context and build entire religions off of such. We want to be Bible believers more than we are anything else because that is what settles it before God. In John chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Beloved, or 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. I mean, you know why you hold your Bible in your hand when I'm preaching, right? You want to be able to see if what the preacher is saying is biblically sound and biblically correct. I am not God. I am not. I am just like you. And I hold the same Bible in my hand. My friend, my word is not God. But God's word is God's word. So believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know we the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Antichrist. Most people think about a solitary figure that is going to rise one day in those times of tribulation and Jacob's trouble, etc. But my friend, there are already many antichrists as we read in 1 John. Very simply, antichrist is just that, antichrist. They do not believe in Jesus Christ the Son. People can be antichrist. Music can be antichrist. Books can be antichrist. Philosophies can be antichrist. The spirit of antichrist is everywhere you know what i need to counter it continuing in the things which i have learned that's why it's so important to be a pupil a student a disciple of jesus christ and learn more about him number two we must continue on a closed mind guards against hypocritical demands a closed mind guards against hypocritical demands. Letter A, the tendency to negate biblical principles. The tendency to negate biblical principles. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. We were already there. Look at what the words say in verse number 2 and 3. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. We'll stop right there for just a second. The phrase that really pops out of my mind of those verses is that they have their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know what that means? There's no feeling there. Back in 2013, seems like such a long time ago now, when I had my cancer surgery, I bring up the point again that that big spot of skin they removed on my back shoulder, when they removed that and stitched everything together, there's scar there. And there's scar tissue. And Rachel would love to try to make me feel something there and pinch it and just to see if she could get a rise out of me, etc. But you couldn't because scar tissue has no feeling. My friends, as it waxes worse and worse, we find ourselves in a day where people literally have no feeling toward God, no emotion toward Him. And we are in a situation today that we need the help of God and His Word more than any era of time. As we seek to know the Lord a little bit better, let us know Him so we can minister to other people. It is amazing what people believe that cannot be backed up by the book. I mean, you could go down to the Bible Belt, and as I traveled for many years in evangelism, and you could meet people that believe something so soundly, they're not going to back down, but they can't find anything in the book to prove why they believe what they believe. 
You can have that up here. You can have that anywhere. People take things as Bible truth, things that aren't within the Scriptures. I want to believe the Word of God, and I want to live according to it. So a closed mind guards against hypocritical demands. Letter A, the tendency to negate biblical principles is all around this. Letter B, there's the time to nurture biblical principles. People say, God told me, or the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Be careful. God isn't going to contradict this right here. Okay? You're not supposed to even marvel if Satan's transformed into a minister of light. The deception of Satan is he can trick you into thinking that God told you something when God really didn't tell you something. What do you need? You need the word of God, the sweet spirit of God. God isn't going to contradict his word. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul made sure that his hearers knew that he was not preaching his opinions or his ideas. He didn't want their wisdom to be based upon his enticing words or his excellent speech, but on the very word of God. We must guard our minds against any teaching that makes demands that are not found in God's word. It says in Proverbs 30, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee and be found a liar. God's word is pure and sure in spite of the devil, in spite of your fear, in spite of everything. Number three, a closed mind guards against hopeless diversions. A closed mind guards against hopeless diversions. Letter A, guarding our minds from endless diversions. It says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. A good rule is, if it doesn't edify, eliminate. Let me say that again. A good rule is, if it doesn't edify, eliminate. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Some people are well adversed in nothingness. Good things can even keep us from the best things. In 1 Corinthians 6.12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. We ought not have in our liberty something that has the power over us aside from God and His Word. Letter B, growing our minds for eternity's destination. Ask yourself as you start a day, ask yourself as you start a week, what on my to-do list will make it to eternity? And I believe when you first start this, you will find out that there's things on your to-do list that really aren't going to matter for eternity. Now, you ought to take care of what God has given you. You ought to be a good steward of all that you have. Now, I'm not saying don't mow the yard, don't take care of the house. Uh, those things would cause you not to be a good steward of what gifts God has given to you. But I am asking you this question. When you look at your list of things to do for that week, what are you doing and what are you investing in that's going to make a difference for eternity? We need to grow our minds. For eternity's destination. Uh, destinations are never reached by taking exits. And sometimes we take detours and it takes us a little longer to get to where we want to go. But my dear friends, as Christians, we ought to want to get to that destination of glorifying God with what we do and who we are. Number four, a closed mind guard against hindered diligence guards against hindered diligence letter a god's exercise program 
Now, you may have an exercise program of your own, and it's very good to have an exercise program of your own, to be a good steward of the body that God has given to you. But God says there's something that's even greater than that. And before I go to exercise, I pray this verse to God. And if God doesn't want me to exercise that day, I won't exercise that day. Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. There's greater emphasis in this life than your present physical strength. There's an emphasis on godliness that you and I need to have. The Bible doesn't negate godliness. The Bible emphasizes godliness. And you and I ought to excel in godliness in our lifetime more than any area of our life. And that is found right there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. So how's your exercise program? I'm talking about your exercising in God's way, in godliness. While physical exercise profits for life, spiritual exercise profits for life and eternity. It's the best of both worlds. Because you read something in Proverbs. Turn there with me. Proverbs chapter 3. And I want to show you how spirituality does profit in your physical life today. Now as you're turning to Proverbs chapter 3, I'm going to remind you of a verse in another location. Keep going to Proverbs chapter 3. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, 16, honor thy father and thy mother. Same thing with Ephesians chapter 6, that honoring and that obeying of mom and dad gives you long life. It's a promise from God. But look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 3, our famous verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding, so be spiritual, trusting God. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. That's godliness, living for God. It shall be what? Ooh. Health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of all that increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now again, I, I love to exercise, but that is only going to profit me physically. But when you look at 1 Timothy 4, what you see is godliness and exercising godliness not only profits you for the life that is to come, but it profits you in your life right now. Do you see here? That if you do not have a spiritual life, you are risking the life and health of your physical body. Godliness, spirituality, trust in God profits a person's physical body. But then also as you looked at verse number 10, that spirituality profits your prosperity as well. Being a godly person, a spiritual person, is more important than being a physically fit person, as it's taught in 1 Timothy chapter 4. God's exercise program. So as we look at letter A, God's exercise program, we need to recognize that God is more important. The very first thing we seek in life. Letter B, God's emphasis proclaimed. It is amazing how diligent and disciplined we can be in areas of little importance. We just have to watch the big game. We just have to watch the news. We have to go to work, eat lunch, work out, etc. But how diligent are we in godliness? In Acts 24, 16, and herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Here's what Paul says, I exercise myself in this godliness. I exercise myself in that. I can lay my head on a pillow at night with a clear conscience before God and a clear conscience before man. That's what Paul says he exercised himself in. Number five, a closed mind... Guards against harmful departure. Of course, probably the saddest thing is when you have your brother or sister in Christ, somebody newly saved, somebody that's been around for a long time in church, they make a departure from faithfulness. Letter A, your establishment of faithfulness. Your establishment of faithfulness. This is important. 
So what we understand is our foundation is Jesus Christ, the strongest and most sure foundation that there is. Our Christianity is built on Him, but we need to securely establish our roots to be rooted and grounded in Christ. Otherwise, we have this tendency to lean in ways that are not good for the glory of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, we've read this already. I remind you that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. My dear friend, I don't want to be part of the some. I don't want anybody that walks through these doors to be part of the sum that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I don't want to know a person that is influenced from this pulpit with these people who have left the things of God. But my Bible tells me as sure as it's daytime right now that there will be some who depart from the faith. Paul said it like this in 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. This present world can pull you away. In 1 Timothy 5 verse 15, For some are already turned aside after Satan. You depend on God, but can he depend on you? In God's book of remembrance, I think faithful and famous can be the same word. Look at letter B. On your pages, your effect on the future. It's not just our lives that are on the line here. Sure, we can make our own choices and live with the consequences, but what about others who are watching? In the last verse of this chapter, Paul reminds Timothy to take heed and continue. He says, For in doing this, as we've referenced already, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. When we get to heaven, we will probably be surprised at the number of people who are there because of our testimony of faithfulness. Think about it. Have you ever prayed for people to be saved? Have you ever given money to missions? Have you ever handed out a gospel tract? Have you ever witnessed to someone? We don't get to see most of those results and efforts, but God takes it all and uses it precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, to bring people to himself, as it says in Isaiah 28 verse 10. What a tragedy that we fail to keep the wrong thoughts from our minds, and as a result, someone then can miss Everything eternal that you know. Again, we emphasize that we need to take heed unto ourselves and the doctrine. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. It is important to live for the glory of God. The author says it was a busy day on the farm. He grew up on a farm. It was harvest time and hundreds of bales of hay needed to be brought in. Making hay when the sun shines is a motto, and it's well known to a diligent farmer. But just as we were headed to the fields, word came that the cows were out. We pastured our cows across the river on some rented land. Mom had gotten a phone call from some of the neighbors that our cows were running across their cornfields, and the neighbors were not happy. We abandoned our task of bailing the hay and drove as fast as we could to the pasture. Being on the other side of the river, we had to drive several miles to get there. And when we did, the cows were everywhere and enjoying every minute of this newfound freedom. Once out of a pasture, the cows can get very disoriented. For the next several hours, we chased cows. In the middle of it all, I got stung on the top of my head by a bumblebee. My dad was running cows down from seemingly all over the country. My mom was running back home to get ice for my head. And I was bawling my eyes out. I was just a kid. But I'll never forget that day. Yes, I was the one that left the gate open. My dad never spanked me for my negligence. I guess he figured the bee had inflicted enough pain. People were frustrated, cows were injured, milk production was down for the next two days, and part of the harvest was lost because I didn't close the gate. Here's the question that Paul gives. Ye did run well, who doth hinder you? 
we can all be hindered in this life and we can all leave the gate open and suffer loss. But the Bible exhorts us that we should not suffer loss of this reward as we will continue in the things which we have learned. Your mind is the gateway to your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Will you leave the gate wide open or will you guard what goes in and what goes out? A closed mind is so important. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you today, we understand the old statement that Rome wasn't built in a day. And we realize that our Christianity, though it was accomplished and finished in Christ at that day at Calvary, we recognize that you're still working on us. To make us what we ought to be. Though we are complete in you as we read in your epistles. We also understand that there is a work that is continuing. So Lord I pray that you would allow us to see the need. To allow you to work in our lives. And then take the step that we need to take. To fulfill and be faithful. Thank you for the opportunity to guard our minds. And guard our hearts. And we pray that we would learn how to do a better job at it for your glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people prayed and said.